please let them all be in this random pile on the floor. Today on Dead Dodge Garage, we take a look at the not so greasy side of the 66 Cornet 500 convertible, which is finally back on the lift. Brother, that's a 67. 10 seconds in and you've already messed it up. At least one viewer remarked that it's very clean under here. That is not a trick. It really is. The car's been apart for quite some time, so things are pretty dusty, but everything is fresh and clean and painted. Here's a pretty nice look at the underside of the Freshen 383. And here's a look at one of the most important pieces, the adapted General Motors transmission from Silver Sport Transmissions. The kit includes this custom modified cross member that makes room for the bigger transmission and its mount. It includes these adapter transmission cooling lines. Installing those is one of my next jobs. They also include a drive shaft. The problem is you have to install the transmission first and give them a measurement so they will make you one. So we don't have that yet, but I'm gonna handle that now. The rear brakes are one of very few pieces under here that have not been restored. They may well be assembled as they are for now. You can see the fuel line set up coming down here from behind the engine and then following the frame rail this way. Basically the same as a factory send and return system, the difference being this is a 3 8 line and a 5 16 line. They end up back here in front of the fuel tank. Here's a nice view of that whole assembly. Everything is new and shiny. Very cool. Currently, I'm just kind of going over the underside of the car. I need to nut and bolt everything and remove things like this. Oh, here's a little job I need to do. Add torsion bar clips, because they're missing. Here's a view of the custom Speedo adapter that sneaks in there. Bit of a tight fit. So I'm just sort of going over the car and documenting what I need. Here's one thing I really need. The bracket that holds these lines and this e-brake cable. The rallying cry on this car, of course, is everything is here. So I'm sure it's in a box somewhere. <laughs> Boop. It's nothing like a nice, short, nowhere near complete list. Transmission cooling lines. Aftermarket lines, um, Bent nowhere near correct. Kind of had to add this and stretch things out. Originally, the transmission cooling lines ran here on the driver's side and came over here, but uh, well, things are different now. So these aftermarket lines are put on the wrong side to connect that random aftermarket eBay radiator to this aftermarket transmission that never should have been here using these flexible sections here. Of course, they want to live in the same place I put the fuel lines in, so some bracketry will be required, I think. Also need to go find pipe adapters. Oh yeah, note this little puddle of happiness. The oil filter got dented or something and it leaks. After I get the cooling line situated, we'll be really close to able to run this thing. But before I do that, I'm gonna go through and, you know, just tighten some stuff. The Silver Sport installation instructions, which yes, I actually have looked at, instruct me to run those lines across the passenger side rail with zip ties. I think we can do a little better than that. There we go. Transmission lines go inside the fuel lines and all is well. And they'll reach perfectly. Again, need a bracket to get them up off the torsion bar because we definitely don't want that. It's just so good. Note, this is a convertible. When you put it up on the two post lift, you can very easily see the door jam open up. I'm gonna recommend we add subframe connectors to this thing. It definitely can't hurt. A few minutes of random digging around in this fitting collection, and I found the correct, not factory, transmission cooling line adapters. Not bad. They fit pretty nice. Now. Oh, uh, also, source of oil leak confirmed. Why is there a hole punched in the filter? Yep, super pleased with that. Just needed to secure it up there, and I call that good to go. Instead of like fabricating some fancy bracket, I decided to keep it simple, stupid and use a factory style line clip on those in a perfectly aligned hole. While I was at it, I also added one to the fuel lines as well as a couple of the S clips that keep the two lines together. That looks a lot nicer. One small annoyance about this setup, because there are two lines here and the bottom one is huge, it doesn't really tuck up under the body and you can see it from next to the car from certain angles. So either I need to bend those up in there better or come up with some other clever solution. 
trying to think of everything here. It's a tight fit for these components, and the last thing I want to do is create something that's going to make annoying noises, so need to watch out for that sort of thing. All right, I'm very pleased with this. Next. Mm -hmm. Hey, remember, however much you think you know, there's always time to learn. I thought the bracket that held the brake line came from here. Nope. It goes from here. Neat. Which means there's also a speed nut missing. You know what they say, paint it black and do something else. If there's one thing I love, it's huffing paint. This Worth Satin Black Trim Paint gets a serious workout in this shop. It's basically the slightly nicer, more professional version of the 75 Black I always use. A successful day of corn amp progress. All the brake lines are connected, except for one. That bracket's in the car, too. Neat. Ah, oh, so much left to do, though. That's future Jamie's problem. Today is several days later, and I've made some more progress on the coronet. I've got all the brake lines connected underneath now. I put it back on the ground and torqued the rear suspension and U-bolts. And I've also torqued the front suspension. At least, for now. Um, I'm going to have to loosen the upper arms, obviously, to do an alignment. And these sway links are too short, so the bar is hitting the strut rod. I've seen this before. Common problem. Going to need longer links. My next task, connect this already bled master cylinder to the brake system, bleed it front to back, get a pedal that works, and then I'll install the exhaust. Once that's done, we'll put it back on the ground, fill it with fluids, and, well, we might just break this thing in this week. Okay, so when I said I tightened all of the brake fittings, obviously that was wishful thinking. I did find a couple more things to torque, like the lower ball joints. And if you hadn't noticed, I finally did. The sway bar's upside down. Much better. Now the big question. Do we have brakes? Well, the pedal's loose, but it does something. Hole in your oil filter, not what you want. Exhaust time. I have to add an oxygen sensor bung there somewhere. Oxygen sensor bung for the EFI installed, welded in place, and plugged for now. I don't want to ruin the new sensor by breaking in the engine with it in there without power. Well, the exhaust system is definitely going to need some work. It was held to the frame rails with self-tapping screws, and it was kind of a gas tank in the way, so some things are going to have to change. Apparently these are a GTX exhaust tip, and they're supposed to have a holding bracket here too, which of course this thing doesn't. All right, this thing's now holding engine oil, steering fluid, transmission fluid, and brake fluid for the most part. Tomorrow I'll dump some water in there. We'll use that for braking. We'll drain it out later and put antifreeze in there. Yeah, these straps need to go. We need actual flexible stuff here, otherwise this thing's gonna be a complete rattle trap and we don't want that. Got the exhaust bolted to the car for now. I did get proper hangers, but uh, I'm just using the self-tapper holes that were there because they're actually proper bracket hanger thingies for these GTX tips, and I don't want to finalize the height of the pipes until I know those are going to fit. Don't have them yet. This is pretty nice, though. Borla mufflers, all clamped. H crossover pipe there. Pretty sweet setup. It does hang a little low for my taste. If this was tucked like another inch up in there, you probably wouldn't see it from the side of the car. But also, if it was tucked another inch up in there, it wouldn't have fit with this transmission, so good enough, I guess. Coronet's all full of water, ready for break-in. I am ruining this perfectly good aluminum overflow tank from Be Cool and painting it black, so it blends in in the Coronet engine compartment. That'll be a nice touch. Who says Ford parts aren't good for anything? Can't believe Tom was throwing that away. Hey, that looks pretty nice. Have to come up with a couple small brackets for the pucos off the tank, but yeah, looks pretty good to me. I didn't clamp any of those hoses. There's no pressure in them. Maybe I'll do that later just for fun. Okay, admittedly, that's not ideal. We push the cornet outside and we're ready to break in the engine. To do this, we're gonna use the Mopar or Nocart for the ignition system. Because this car is getting EFI, it seems really silly to set it up for the old stuff just to rip it back apart, so we'll do this. We also needed an electric fuel pump. Was the distributor 180 out? Of course it was. Why wouldn't it be? Eh, a slight teething issue here too. Uh, transmission cooling lines leak. One of them just needed to be snugged up. The other one... Uh, I don't want to talk about it. Oh good. Like it never happened. 
Definitely like this. That was fire. It's coughing out the carb that whole time. Jesus. That's cool. That was a bad one. Okay. Still no pressure? Nope. Wow. I don't know what I'm missing here. Something. Well, that can't be good. All right, well, time to dig into this thing and figure out why uh, we've only got compression on one cylinder. I have a guess. My guess is all the valves are hanging open. There's also another slight transmission leak, but we don't need to worry about that. Well, theory confirmed, this is with the rocker arms all loose. Now we have compression on this side. Neat. Well, things have gotten pretty scientific here, and I've learned a couple things. The first thing I learned is that this block has been decked, and that's got to be part of the equation here. I think it's a lot of different things adding up. These aftermarket valves sit up a little high too. Add to that, aftermarket replacement rocker arms. Similar, not quite the same. I did compare a lifter at a number one exhaust on this engine to a brand new comp lifter, and well, they're the same. I was ready to chalk this up to a bunch of small differences adding up to a big one, until I noticed this. On the right, a shiny new push rod from this engine. On the left, a random old one I found on the ground. Notice the push rod out of the engine actually does have one shorter end. Apparently that's for an earlier engine. Um, some of these rocker arms have smaller cups, but ours don't. So these were already wrong. We knew the push rod was right around eight and a half inches and uh, checking it with the measuring tape said, sure, it's really close, but it's not close enough. This is what we need. I'm gonna go see if I can find 15 more of them and then clean them. Now, just for the record, we didn't build this engine, so not our fault. Please let them all be in this random pile on the floor. Otherwise, I'm going to have a bad time here. Well, that's weird. There are actually 18 of them. Well, yeah, better than 15. Yeah, just in case you were wondering what a 440 pushrod looks like compared to a 3D3, like that. And again, that one's got the smaller ball on the one side, so must be an earlier engine. Mm-hmm. I have to clean all these random ground find push rods and get them ready to put in the fresh new engine. I did go ahead and put a blankie on the car because now it's right in the way. Hey, those actually cleaned up really well. Now for a brake clean bath and um, I'll put them in the driver's side and make sure I'm right. This operation is sure easier on small block heads where they have holes that keep the push rods roughly in the right spot. I learned this trick from the one and only Steve Dulcich. Use the length of mechanics wire to hold the push rods roughly in place. And then... You do the rocker arm flip. You hook them all under the springs, like so, and walk them up. So much easier than, you know, yelling at it, like I did for five minutes, before I remembered the wire trick. Once you do have all the push rods in their sockets, tighten the shafts down evenly, Bolt, 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 bit by bit. And make sure you check all the push rods several times and make sure both ends are still seated correctly. Now the big question, was I right? Is it fixed? Yes. Except that I now have to do it to this side as well, which is buried under a bunch of brand new hoses and it's gonna be really irritating. Hopefully the steps I took to figure this out kind of make sense to you. I can't exactly explain how I knew that there was valves hanging open and, well, this must be the way to go. We'd already pulled the cover once and, well, nothing was loose or falling apart and everything looked correct, so it just had to be valves. It had to be. A compression number of zero is valves. There's just no way a bad ring seal can get you that low. Zero is valves or, you know, something really horrible. Now, again, we didn't put this engine together. And the thing is, if someone were to order push rods for a 64 engine and put them in a 67 engine with 67 rocker arms, 
That would explain this. It's an easy mistake to make, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It has occurred to me some of you may be wondering how we could possibly have one good firing cylinder with the wrong push rods in the engine. Well, easy explanation, really. Um, the machining on the valves is not consistent, so the valve heights vary some. And the push rods aren't exactly consistent either, so little machining difference here, little machining difference there. Could well be that valves on one cylinder actually closed all the way. Well, that's interesting. This engine has all factory head bolts, except that one. The lesson here, as usual, is check everything, scrutinize every little piece, and don't take anyone's work for granted. That includes your own. And now for the moment of truth. I'm sure you can hear that. It's fixed. Totally different sound. I just have to wrap up the valve covers and we'll break this thing in tomorrow, I guess. And there we go. Like it never happened. From the last failed attempt at starting it, pushing it back in here, finding the problem, and fixing it to this point, ready to go again, almost exactly three hours. Not exactly NASCAR pit crew time, but good enough. Back under the coronet on the left. Just need to snug up that union on this transmission line, wipe this fluid up and we should be good to go. What a lovely day to break in a big block. We didn't do this one on the cart because it was already assembled on the K-frame and it's got air conditioning and power steering and it was just way too much work. Hey, don't kick that. Okay. It's not going very good though. There we go. It's because it's full. Ready? Yep. Cool. That's what should have happened yesterday. Yep. Come on, guy. There it is. It's nice. Okay. I can use a more choke too. It's pretty cold. <laughs> There you go folks we've got a 67 cornet big block convertible that runs and it sounds really good in fact i didn't even hear any exhaust leaks which seems strange and we did have a couple teething problems but you know that's kind of to be expected the push rod thing obviously was a bit of a surprise this heater valve leaks which is disappointing but frankly not surprising we had a slight oil leak on the back of the engine but that was just from the gauge that we used for the cart it's a pretty well used adapter, so I can't say I'm shocked there either. I've now installed the factory unit. We know there's good oil pressure in there, so when we finish the break-in, I won't be worried. 
The cooling line, of course, is a bit of an issue. I'm gonna have to drop the exhaust and either change that union out or repair one of those flares, cause it's pretty bad. I must say, this Be Cool overflow tank is awesome. The engine had just hit temperature and the thermostat was just opening when we decided to shut it down because of the smoke. There's not a drop of coolant on the ground, so yeah, I'm thinking that's a good setup. Once this thing's cooled down and we've got some more help here, we'll push it back in on the lift, drop the exhaust out of it, and get to work fixing the transmission leak. But for now, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the fact that it runs. In fact, I think it's time for a celebratory beverage. Although it's 10.30 in the morning, so instead of a frosty cold adult beverage, I guess it's another coffee. On the next Coronet installment, we'll be installing the sniper kit and everything else here in this pile. Well, pretty much everything. We'll also be installing the permanent ignition instead of the temporary point stuff that's rigged up in there now. Then it'll be another fun experiment, figuring out if this transmission control module wants to talk to the sniper system on the CAN bus network, or if we have to do something silly like hardwire it to the throttle sensor. I'm excited to see how that works. We'll also be modifying this factory floor shifter to work with that four-speed overdrive transmission. Maybe around that time we'll get the drive shaft from Silver Sport as well. They include it as part of the kit, but you have to install the transmission and get a length measurement to send them. Then they'll make you one up and ship it out. After I'm done with all the mechanical and electrical stuff, of course, this car will be getting a complete restored interior. And it'll be getting all the trim and a detail job. And that's going to be cool too, but... Well, that's not exactly my department. I'm sure we'll see some of that anyway. Well, that's going to do it for this installment. If you want to see more on this awesome cruiser build, maybe you should subscribe, because there will be more updates coming. In the meantime, as usual, thank you very much for watching. And remember, good judgment is mostly gained from experience, and most of that is a result of bad judgment.